Welcome everybody to the April 11th edition of the CAE Community of Practice in Cyber Defense. Know your fellow CAE CDs. We've got three schools presenting uh, this month. Um, we are going to have, uh, first off though, an announcement from the PMO office, uh, Annie Becker, uh, and then we're going to have Elisa Van Overstreeten. I hope I'm pronouncing that close. Uh, forgive me. Uh, she is the Assistant Professor, Cybersecurity Program Coordinator at Clark State College. We have Chris Rondo, who is a Professor, Program Director of Cybersecurity at Bossier Parish Community College. And our third presenter today is Cheryl Simpson, the Program Director of Applied Science, Great Falls College, Montana State University. After those three presentations, we will have our uh, speaker from the Competency Corner, Susan Frank. She, she is the Associate Professor of Cybersecurity at Suffolk County Community College, and she is going to be presenting on uh, pr present problems to students the way, or, or I'm sorry, present problems to students the way their bosses will. Uh, so we also, just as a reminder, we have a registration for all presenters and future presentations that is on the link here. Uh, so if you're new, uh, by all means, make sure to register uh, for your own link. Um, after all the presenters have presented, we are going to stop the recording and we will have breakout rooms so that you can visit each individual or move through the rooms uh, so that you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the presenters for more information. Um, uh, after all of that as well, we're going to uh, mention the May meeting presenters for our next meeting. We do have quite a few schools actually signed up for the throughout the end of the year. And then Yair will wrap up and give provide even additional details just on how to get into the breakout rooms uh, for specifics. Okay, so our uh, next or our uh, next up is Annie Becker from the PMO office. Are you on, Annie? Yep, I'm here. Thanks, Wonderful. Annie. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, just wanted to hop on uh, just some upcoming event announcements. Um, as you all know, the CAE Symposium is next week, and there'll be a um, half-day PMO meeting on Thursday, along with a designation ceremony. So we'll have about 33 schools that will get um, designated at that event. So we're looking forward to it. Um, and then also we held our first CAE orientation meeting last month. Um, we had a lot of good involvement. There was um, over 190 attendees. Um, and then we also had the um, COP breakout session afterward, which was very informative as well. So thank you, Yair, for helping out with that. Um, so the next session that we have is June 25th from 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, just a reminder, it is a mandatory requirement for both new and redesignating institutions. Uh, we will send out um, an invite reminder for that as we get closer to the date. Um, and then finally, we have our uh, CAE lecture series at the end of the month, April 26th um, from 2 to 4 p.m. And we'll also send a reminder for that as well. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you. So our first school up is uh, Clark State College. And so go ahead, Elisa, uh, share your slides. Yes, sure. Oops, not on my normal computer. Completely understandable. <laughs> I'm a desktop girly and I'm on a laptop, so. <laughs> Understand. All right, I think I have it showing, correct? Yep, it is. If you can put it in presentation mode, that'd be great. And just, I am... and just to interject, uh, just as a reminder to all the presentations, you've got 10 minutes uh, each to present. I cannot see. Go up to slideshow. Yeah, you can go up to slide. I can't see it. Um, mm -hmm. The way the screen is, okay. I have something press, blocked. Do you have a little press icon? Press an F5. Oh. F5? There All right, thanks. Didn't do anything. Oh, give it a minute. Oh, there. Yeah. Are we good? All right. <laughs> okay. Hello, I'm um, Elisa Van Overstraten, um, Clark State College. Um, my partner here is Matt Clint. Um, 
So we worked very closely together. Clark State was actually a CAE before I started. I started in January of 2021, so I was completely unfamiliar with the program. Um, we we lost um, um, the instructor that was handling that, so it has been, you know, all the times that the CAE program wants to make sure that you have a succession plan in place, it's a really good idea to take that very seriously, guys, because it was extremely difficult to pick up the pieces after um, um, the death of the person that was handling the program. We were successfully redesignated um, late last year and Matt and I will be at the symposium in um, Kentucky and walking across the stage and doing our part, which is very exciting. Um, Matt and I kind of work together. I handle more of the cybersecurity part, but he handles more of the networking. And of course, as everybody knows, Everything works well together. Um, is this going to work? There. Okay. Uh, we, a couple of, right now, the validated POS is just the cybersecurity degree. It's under our applied business and applied technology program. We do the operate and maintain from the NICE cybersecurity framework. We really feel that our subject matter expertise is probably in the way that we engage with our students and preparing them for the workforce. I know a lot of people do a great job engaging with their students, but that's something that we've been very focused on lately. Um, as far as the next POS, um, because our program has had so many transitions and, and we're changing and growing and updating things, we do not intend on having an, another um, POS at this point. Um, we also are not really a research school, so we do not have any research projects running. We would absolutely be happy to partner with other institutions, though. We we like um, working with others and our students, you know, having them have the ability to work with people around the country is wonderful, too. Okay, so when we go back to talking about the subject matter expertise, Matt, do you want to talk about this? Because it was wonderful. Matt just started last year, our, and this is where his leadership came in. <laughs> Alyssa, we're not seeing the slides progressing. Oh. Hey, Matt, do you have it? Do you want to just throw it on yours? Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Um, stop sharing, and I can share it if you want to. Is that yes, you mean? thank you. That's what I meant, yeah. Thank you for letting me know. I guess I should have asked that. Let's open. Let me catch the right one here. Isn't it always the technology instructors have technology issues and presentations? Can you see that okay? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. It's always the tech people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Uh... One of the things that I noticed when I, I came on board was a, a little bit of a disconnect with our uh, students and their pathways out of the school. Anybody that's coming to a two-year college is looking to either uh, better a current position, um, move into a new position, or even uh, springboard to a four-year university. And one of the things that we were trying to do was to help supplement their um, pathways out of Clark State outside of the classroom. So what better way to do that than just kind of create a community, create a, a club, if, if you will. And that's what we did. Uh, one of the students, um, he and I sort of brainstormed with this and brought it to Elisa. And she's like, yeah, let's do this. And uh, it has been an incredible start. Honestly, we've, we're have we coming up on a year right now with this cyber club. Um, <clears throat> its goals are to meet students where they're at. Uh, to do everything that they can to basically find a job outside of the outside of their schooling. Um, we do things like resume building. We do we bring in uh, speakers from all over the place to try and provide some um, outside experience, if you will. Uh, let like students ask questions and, and do all kinds of things with that. They. Uh, they help each other out with their coursework even. Uh, that's some of the collaboration that we do. And um, 
our biggest tool, honestly, was Discord. We uh, we lit up a Discord server for them at the uh, request of one of our cyber club officers. And that has really, really taken off. Um, one of our biggest goals was to meet the students where they're at. Well, a lot of the tech geeks in our industry are gamers too. So we sort of uh, met them where they're communicating and it has been incredible. So um, I look forward to a lot more of this and uh, engagement with the students. It's been great. Let me carry on here. Uh -huh. um, I, are you really guys the... seeing a slide about grants? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good. Uh, basically, we had a lot of grants that we wrapped up um, in 21 and 22. That was still kind of a legacy information. The most current grant we applied for was the uh, excellent grant. And we do uh, collaborate with a lot of other schools. Do you want to move forward, Matt? Yeah. Great. These are some of the schools that we do work with, Wright State University, Sinclair Community College, Columbus State, uh, University of Cincinnati, University of Dayton, Air Force Institute of Technology. Right here in our backyard is Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So that's why we have the Air Force Institute of Technology. I have been working with my uh, the school I used to work at, Edison Community College, and trying to convince them to get on board too. Um, we certain just once again, I just want to offer our uh, partnership abilities. So if you have uh, an interest of bringing in on another community college for a program, please let us know. Do you want to go one more slide, please? Oh, and then the other thing: what could you use help with? My current passion probably for the last couple of years is more in the digital forensic side. I've been looking at different ways to partner with our criminal justice program. Um, I do externship work in digital forensics. I'd like to know who's teaching digital forensics. Are you partnering with, say, the police academy on campus? And how is that working out? My major concern is um, the police academy students have a certain set of knowledge my IT, you know, tech students have a certain set of knowledge and yes, they need to get to the same place in many cases, but they're not starting at the same place. And I wanted to know if anyone was doing that successfully and if they wanted to um, talk about that. If you could go forward, Matt. That was, well, the that was it. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, those are excellent um, presentations. Thank you very much. Okay, our next uh, presenter is Chris Rondeau from the Bossier Parish Community College. So, there we go, oh, perfect. Okay, so let me get a timer going. I can be long-winded, but I also talk fast a lot of times, so we'll see what all we squeeze in here. First off, I wanna say from the, from the last call, I'm jealous that y'all can have your own Discord, and I saw a lot of people like, oh yes, wanna do that. For whatever reason, our school policy has said we cannot have and maintain any social media of any kind of our own. Uh, so I've had to get rid of Discord. I've had to get rid of, of Instagram, Facebook, all the social media platforms that I have by school policy. So it makes it really interesting to try to connect with students where, where they're at. So uh, so first off, hi, I'm, I'm Chris Rondo. I'm with Bossier Parish Community College, and uh, we've been with the CAE project for community colleges since its inception. Um, so uh, back in 2008, there was a meeting up in Seattle talking about would it be a benefit to have two-year schools be a part of the community? And so then once CAE2Y was initiated, um, we jumped on that. The first process of mapping and aligning with the old CNSS standards was a booger, uh, to say the least. But so we got that back in 2011, and then we've been continuing with the project ever since then. So uh, I've been the POC on this project since its inception. I've gone through at least three um, alt POCs at this point. So that's one of the reasons I don't have one listed on here. My current alt POC announced his resignation uh, and is leaving us in two weeks. And so I need to find somebody else to fill into that role. Um, so our current validated POS is a cybersecurity AAS. And so constantly working with our advisory board to keep that updated 
in trying to keep on current trends, what's happening in it. Uh, our faculty in this area that are, are subject matter experts range from ex information assurance, network security, and forensics. So that goes into the previous talk where we're always just looking for new people that can kind of bring in that fresh blood within there. I, I love having industry that can come in and be um, part-time instructors for me because for me, I've been in academics for 20 plus years. So I, I know what I know here, but I need people who have the fresh blood that come in, that have the industry, that are touching the tools uh, and not just us old professors that, that are around the system. Uh, our next mapping is going to be for our systems admin and DevOps. Uh, it, it should be a fairly easy thing to map. I have not submitted any uh, applications yet to start this alignment process or this mapping process, uh, but that's to come. I've already been talking with the program managers over that that degree here at our school. Uh, we have all of our notes together, so it's just a matter of pulling the trigger and moving forward. But here again, that program director has let me know that he's going to be leaving the school within the next year and a half. So that's going to be a, a changeover in personnel. So I'm probably going to try to get that done with him before he leaves. And then who, whoever inherits his role, I'll say congratulations. Uh, you get to be the uh, lead on this part of the project. So we'll see how that goes. Research interest. So again, like with the other school that was on before me, we're not a research focused school, but we do have things that we're trying to work with in the community and be sure that we're keeping a, a, our systems valid, being sure we're, we're getting information out to our community, uh, that we are an integral part of what's going on. Just like the other school, we're right side of, outside of an Air, Air Force base. We're right outside of Barksdale Air Force Base, which is where Global Strike uh, Command is, is at. So we do a lot with them for 8570 and 8140 standards, being sure we're tr keeping their personnel trained, uh, but then also whatever other types of boot camps that they need us to help leverage. Uh, so we do work with them on a lot of those projects. Um, the last bullet I have on here about IBCs, I mean, obviously everybody in this call knows the value of industry-based credentials, uh, but that's one of the things that's been something as I've talked with other schools, they're talking about, oh yeah, we we map to these certs. Well, no, we, Bipsy, we do not map to the certs. We're aligned with them. We want to teach you the content and you gaining the knowledge to be able to go in after the cert is a byproduct of the course, but not the direct uh, purpose of, of the course. And so we've had some people think that's rather interesting uh, that we don't uh, just teach to the, to the exams, but that's not the purpose. We want you to have the knowledge. That's one of the things that we've had with uh, some of our industry partners here is they've actually told us they prefer to get the students from Bipsy, even though it's a two-year degree instead of a four-year degree, because they know they're getting that hands-on training and it's not just book knowledge. They can dump them in on the tools and they can get in there and start playing with it. So it's more than just a book knowledge of that. As far as uh, specialty areas, subject matter, just kind of showing a little bit of how diverse we are and everything that's going on there. So we have uh, three AESs that we're working on, multiple certificates of different types that we have. So a wide berth that we're trying to touch with, with our industry partners here, um, from fiber to health, uh, to, to gaming, everything and game design, all that fun stuff. So just all over the place. As I already said, a number of our people are out in industry right now and currently working. I have a lot of adjuncts that are full-time. Uh, in industry. But also on the flip side, uh, two of my full-time faculty are full-time here, but they have their own IT businesses on the side. So that kind of helps out also because they are they are staying better in touch than I do at what's happening in trends because they're making the modifications to their own IT business. Uh, so that so that does help out. Now, I just, I'm kind of selling myself short a little bit, I guess. I do IT stuff on the side, but more as uh, a volunteer for different different areas. So I do have to touch the technology outside of the classroom. So I'm not just in one little wheelhouse here at the campus. I, I do stuff offsite just uh, on a volunteer basis instead of paid basis. Um, grants that we're involved in. Uh, so these are three of the major ones. We have other ones that we're working on, uh, but these are some of our, our bigger grants that we're working on. Uh, the Louisiana Reboot Project, this is a great opportunity for students that are non-traditional to try to get back into the classroom and what's happening. There's lots of funding in that to pay for their classes, pay for certifications, 
um, and extend extra resources to them that's not available just to our traditional students because of the way that grant was written. Um, both AT&T and GDIT have partnered with us in different opportunities as far as, for instance, vouchers. Uh, we have projects that if our students are in a certification aligned course, then if they have an A at midterm, these organizations are funding the voucher costs for these students. And so that way there's not a reason why a student shouldn't be able to leave our program without at least three or four IBCs under their belt. Um, so that's been a great process with them. GDIT, one of the things that we're starting to do with them as part of this project also is their decommissioned laptops. So they have laptops that they can't just get rid of because of the work that was done on them. And so we're starting an endeavor with them where our students that have gone through our IT hardware and IT software class are working at getting clearance through GDIT, which is also right next door to us. Literally, I can walk across the street and I'm at, I'm at GDIT headquarters uh, right here in Bossier. Um, so we're working with them to get clearance for them to get into that facility. And what they're going to be doing is reconditioning those laptops, removing the, the old hard drives, going through the decommissioning process of those, um, and then setting up those computers to be re recycled. Um, and so what those computers GDIT is graciously doing is they're donating those computers to our cyber students uh, to help further our program. Uh, something our students don't know since none of them are on this call is all of our students that are volunteering for this process, they're all getting to keep one of the laptops uh, that they reconditioned. So that's kind of a fun add on with that. Schools that we're currently, oh, I'm running out of time. I got a minute 30 left. Okay, I had a timer going. I told you I could be long-winded. Um, two of our local schools that we really work with, LSU and Louisiana Tech, they're both CAEs. Uh, LSU just got their, or LSU Baton Rouge just got their CAE last year. Louisiana Tech is a CAER. And so working with both of them on different, different grant collaborations. Uh, there was a cyber uh, games event next door last weekend at the tech facility. And LSU, we were down there in two weeks doing a, a joint project with them on some other uh, initiatives we're working on. But always look for other schools. We obviously have a lot more that we have articulation agreements with uh, that we work with. Um, enhancements, gaps, faculty is always the thing. It's, it's a changeover of faculty and, and what's happening. Uh, some of our faculty are uh, military also that are, that are adjuncts for us. So when they get uh, moved, then that is an issue there. Motivation for cyber competitions. Uh, that's one of those biggest things. Everybody else has kind of chimed in that they have the ability to do social media to connect with their students or meet the students where they're at. Since that has been taken away from me, that's been one of my biggest challenges is how do I motivate students off campus to want to come back and do stuff since we're a, a commuter college. So getting involved in competitions have been a real uh, headache for me to try to get my students in that and going on with it. Um, what else do I want to say? Just, I, it's been a fun ride with this project. It started back with the old CSEC program and just, I'm excited to see where we go um, in the future with this. And so and that's my timer. So I'm officially out of time. So I'll surrender there. Very well done. And I noticed you pronounced uh, your school Bossier Parish. Yes. Yep. yep. Right. Good old French names. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Thank you for that. And thank yep. you for managing your time so well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next uh, presenter is Cheryl Simpson from Great Falls College, Montana State University. Hi there. Let me yeah. just see if I can get my screenshot all set up right there. How's that look? Can you guys see that? Okay. Excellent. Fabulous. So hi, again, I'm Cheryl Simpson from Great Falls College in Montana. We're a, a two-year, apparently this is the, the two-year version. We also have Maelstrom Air Force Base right next door. So apparently we're all about our Air Force Bases too. Um, we here at Great Falls um, have been a CAE since 2017. We've been kind of adjusting our program over the last couple of years. Um, our current um, program of study is our Cyber AAS which we advertise it as an entirely remote, but we do give students the option of some in-person classes. Mm -hmm. 
because Montana being such a, a large state, a lot of our students are not able to drive into campus. It might be an hour, it might be two, it might be a snowstorm. So we've really focused on being able to offer an online version with our local adjuncts. Um, our instructors for our cyber are all um, subject matter experts in their field. We have one who works at Raytheon and we have one that works at a financial company here in town, but essentially they do this for a living, which was kind of part of our advertising for our cyber degree. Um, we used to have a um, POS of networking, which we have recently removed due to lack of interest and lack of enrollment. Um, we actually didn't, we were doing a, a Cisco based um, CCNP, CC, um, and a program, and we just couldn't find the enrollment to do that. So our last program is our computer programming. It is not currently a CAE program validated, but I threw it on here because it balances nicely with our cyber degree. We actually have multiple students right now doing both our cyber and our programming back to back because there's enough carryover of learning the programming to go along with the cyber and learning the cyber with the programming. They actually balance and mesh very, very well together. Um, Part of what we try to focus on here at Great Falls recently has been getting into the AI world. We realized when we talk with our advisory board and our um, businesses in the community, this is a direction we're going to have to go. We're, we're going to have to live in the AI chat GPT world. How do we utilize that to incorporate that into our programs, use it ethically, use it responsibly? It's not something to be afraid of, but it is something to be aware of. So... That's kind of the direction that we try to go in here. Um, as far as our interest, again, we're a two-year college. We don't do a lot of research, but we do focus on trying to get students ready for the workforce is the most important part, whether it be our cyber or our programming degrees. We want to make sure that they understand how to use the tools that we have today. Um, as someone who's um, perhaps in, in my in my 40th year or fourth year, <laughs> I'm in my 40s. I've been in this field for a while. And one of the things I always tell my students is if I was still doing what I did 20 years ago, I would not have a job. You have to constantly stay aware of what the newest things are, whether it be the new tools in cybersecurity, whether it be the new languages in programming, whether it be AI as a broader concept. Um, when we try to encourage AI, we have seminars, we have discussions with our students, we incorporate it into our lectures. Okay, here's the assignment. Now I realize you can go over to AI and ask them how to do it. Why don't we figure out how to prompt Jen correctly so that you learn while you're getting the right answer and how do you utilize that to make yourself more efficient? The second half of that is again, incorporating our programming and our cyber degrees together to encourage scripting, whether it be bash scripting or PowerShell scripting or any type of scripting. Part of the comments I've gotten from industry has been find a way for people to duplicate themselves, write a script to do it 10 times faster than using the, G, the, the, the GUIs or whether you can find a way to verify things or check things using those scripts. So we want to find new ways to teach the students skills that they're going to need when they get into the real world. One of our biggest grants that we're working on right now is our Futures at Work. It's a Montana-based grant that um, encourages students in high school to start getting into cybersecurity early. If we can kind of snag them while they're still undecided, we can do that. So we provide financial support to cover their tuition, their books, and again, those cert fees if they choose to go down that route. What we do is we go to the local schools. We've done some outreach with them to encourage the school to support us as we're working through those um, those courses so their students have some support in their local school as well as the support that we offer them at the college. Um, our students are doing great in it. We um, have currently had in two years now of working with Futures with Grant over 20 students that have started getting certed while they're still in high school that are continuing on the pathway to cybersecurity, AAS to finish it out or to transfer to one of our four-year schools um, in Montana with that background of they already have a couple of computer classes, they've got the basics, they got the understanding there. Um, fortunate thing with the with the grant is they also helped finance some um, advertising and video. So we were able to put out the cybersecurity video um, for Futures at Work to advertise that program for our high school students as well. Oops, 
and I clicked off of it. There you go. Um, our biggest partner, I would say, would be Missoula College, um, who we work with for, we did a Gen Cyber grant with them. We work with them a lot. Missoula College has a cybersecurity center as well. They are a CAE. Um, and they have just worked really, really well with us. Um, it's kind of nice to have someone in Montana be able to understand the Montana um, terminologies and the things that we do here. So it's been great working with Missoula College. In our program specifically, if you asked me what are the things that we struggle with, um, my program is not very large. I do not have a very large graduating class. I would say it's less than 10. Um, our classes are very, very small, which is great because the students get great one-on-one -on -one support. I've had three students text me just this morning saying, can I have help? And I'm like, of course, that's what I do. Um, but as a small college, we have some other issues we deal with. The first and probably the most significant, we require our students to do an internship, again, get into the real world, and they struggle to find a company that is local, so they don't have to do something remote, and a company that is willing to let a college student who hasn't had their degree yet get into their cyber world. Um, just the risk of a student touching things that you need to have more security and more control over. A lot of our local companies are just a little nervous about that. So we struggle with our internship opportunities for our students. We really want to get them, again, those real world experiences and struggle with having companies let us in that case. And they also don't really want to pay for it, but that's a secondary problem. Um, the local businesses in Montana are not really as appropriately concerned about cybersecurity as they should be. Therefore, why would I pay somebody $15, $20 an hour to come in and walk around my building and make sure that it's all safe? Um, so we struggle sometimes with that. And, I'm sorry, was there a question? No, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no worries. Um, sometimes I have trouble with my high school students who um, need to get enrolled. Again, small rural school in the middle of nowhere, Great Falls is, I don't know, 60,000 people. It's one of the top five larger cities in Montana. We we don't worry about things like technology. It's a non-tech centric locale. Um, community awareness. Our program is amazing. We have great people teaching it, but we really have a hard time sometimes getting people in the community involved. And then of course, the marketing and career pathways of advertising tends to look like a movie script. And when students get in and they actually have to start doing the work, um, it's not nearly as much fun as they thought it was going to be. There's a problem in that where I feel like some students are almost sold a bill, the bill of goods. They're, they're told this is all going to be ethical hacking and it's going to be exciting. And oh my God, I'm going to break into the IRS database. Um, and it's not. It's a lot of scanning and mapping and documentation. And I want to make sure that when we advertise our programs, we're honest about what the job actually looks like. So what we've learned in our experience is realistic expectations. We try to take our, like I said, our adjuncts that work in industry, we bring them in to talk to the students, to make them understand this is what the job actually looks like. I walk in in the morning, I sit down at my computer, I start looking through trouble tickets, I start looking through this, that, look through my event logs. Um, Engagement and curriculum design, we've been pushing the um, cyber range on our students to try to get them that hands-on experience. Learning the name of the tool doesn't do you much good if you don't have that experience, um, along with competitions. We're trying, as you mentioned before, to get into the competitions and trying to get the students that feel. Um, sometimes it's hard because if they don't have that experience, that real world experience, they walk into a competition and they come in in last place. They come in and they're like, I was still stuck on the first task and I couldn't get through it because they don't have that real world experience. So we're trying to find new ways to be able to do that. And then of course, making sure that they understand what the role and the career guidance of the program actually is. Why are they here? What is this job going to look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, if we could find ways to get a couple more students in the door, we would feel more comfortable being honest with them. We always struggle, as I'm sure most people do, with we need to increase enrollment. Well, what if I don't have students who want to be enrolled? Well, find a way to get them in the door anyway. Um, so part of our thing is making sure we are transparent in what this job looks like and how they could use it in the real world. Let's see, how did I do on time? Outstanding. Uh that was the end of it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Thank okay. You. 
All right, so our last presentation uh, for this um, uh, uh, session is the Competency Corner, and we have Susan Frank from Suffolk Commu uh, County Community College. Okay, so share my screen. Yes. I can't find the... <laughs> slide your slideshow right next yeah, to the I mean I have my slideshow but <laughs> I have to find the thing is blocking it so I'm gonna oh. be play oh, there's too many I don't want to say okay hmm. <laughs> sometimes if you pull down the window no, then, no, no. then okay. you can get the slideshow <laughs> okay all right so that's a little better get this out of the way a little all right, so I'm Dr. Susan Frank. I'm from Suffolk County Community College, and that's on Long Island, New York. Um, so I want to present problems to students the way their bosses will. So I'm the competency corner. The idea is that we are. Oh, I should. I'm going to start my timer. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Thank you. I, I don't have a good sense of stopping on time. Okay. So I want to present problems to students the way their bosses are going to present them. And this has been very successful for us. Um, so we're on Long Island. We, we're a Hispanic serving institute. And basically we have a mix of everything, every kind of person you could imagine, all ages, races, and financial levels, genders. I, we they Many of them have very demanding family and work lives or, you know, maybe working full time. And they're, they're, we have to deal with many, many reasons why they should fail. And so we have to be very flexible. About half of our students have been going to four year schools afterwards, even though it's an AAS, it's still a lot of them are starting to really want to go on. And then about half get jobs locally. Um, we've had a lot of success with the jobs. We just recently had someone get a four-year degree job with, before he graduated. So it's been it's been great. And it's been really good as far as, um, I think because we have a much denser population to begin with. So even though everyone else around us is losing people, we're, we're basically adding another session and another, you know, expanding to another campus at the same time. So as many as we can, get faculty for, we seem to get. And what happens with that, because we've had to turn down about 20, at least 20 students a year, 20 to 30 students a year, wow. then the better students tend to come early. It just happens. Like we don't, we really don't filter them other than that they have to be at college level reading and college level math. It, just basic being able to read and write and, and speak, you know, and do math. So, but we've been getting really phenomenal students lately, and which compared to five or six years ago, where they sure they were pushing anybody that could walk into this program, and it was a lot harder to teach that. When you have really strong students, it makes it very easy to teach. I, I just, it's really fun. So I have my PhD in computer science, and I started working with that at the FBI in New York City as a computer scientist. So th what they were looking for with the, the job description versus what they wanted were kind of a big mismatch. You had to have all the math and all the pro, you know, like you had to have a computer science degree, but they really wanted a computer specialist who was a cyber, more or less what we're teaching in our two year cybersecurity program is what they wanted there. So I had to do all that. Luckily FBI is really good with training. So I had to do a lot of training. I felt like on day one, I knew nothing about what my job was, I, but I had the ba background knowledge to learn it. But it, I think I was a perfect person to become a competency trainer because as soon as I came to education, I said, I'm going to teach my students the job that you need to do. So I've been, you know, things that I really have used in the FBI I said, you know, I said, these are the things we're going to learn. And so we really, that has been our philosophy. And the other, we have one other, as of now, we have one other full-time faculty member and then one other lab that's lab faculty member. So we don't have a lot. So we just, the three of us basically discuss what we're going to do. And it comes from all our 
pooled experience in the real workforce. Um, so it's pretty much tangible here and now, like that, and you know, we keep our certs up and stuff. So we really keep up, we really try to keep it as real as we can and as hands-on. It was so almost every day we have hands-on labs. And so I I did when I heard of this competency, you know, competencies are going to be required. I I was like, oh, we're there. We totally have competencies. Like, so I was totally made for this kind of, you know. So we our labs, a lot of them we will define only the end goal. And this kind of started with that I started my job two weeks after I was hired and I had, there was no curriculum. So I had to make up the labs each day. Like, you know, tomorrow's lab is going to be, let's think about this. So, but it worked out so well because the students, we, it was more or less just get this to work, make a lamp, you know, you can do this and here's some instructions, figure it out. So it really has worked out well that the students work together to like really well together. So they have to figure out how to do each lab. We don't tell them step by step. Occasionally we do, I have one or two courses where we ever have them purchase the labs where there's step-by-step -step instructions. Those are the least successful in my opinion, because you sort of, you can barely tell if the student got anything out of it. When, when they are not given the answers, they get a lot out of it. They learn the lessons, they, they make the mistakes. So anyway, to discuss competency statements, we're all going to be doing competency statements on the next time you renew, you know, that you get recertified for CAE POS. Um, so this is an example of our domain name service. This is a freshman class. This is the first lab of the second semester. Um, and basic network, they have already taken intro to networking and client operating system. So they're kind of able to do Linux stuff, right? And um, so that's the competency template tells you, A is who's the actor, and you have to say who it is, pretty much what are you expecting them to know when they start. And then B is the behavior. You wanted to say, this is very specific, you know, DCWF, and this is a specific number and a very, I copy pasted this from the DCWF, which the template has a link to this. And you just have to find something that makes sense for what you're doing. Before, I, I think I, for this slide, I just dropped it and put, you know, there's more to it. But in my actual template, I put the full thing. So system administration or some specialized cyber defense applications. So, the C is, now I'm not going to think of it, um, Linux server to host a web page, a web server, and client, and Windows client and server. So you need bind, bash, Linux, CentOS server, and text editor. And then D is the um, degree, and that's, you must be, it must be completed 100%. In this case, sometimes you might have something where it's, 50%, and, you know, it's not that they are going to require you to say 100%, but this is a very specific, you know, if, if it doesn't work, it's useless. So we say, yes, it's got to be done 100%. And um, generally the students have, this is a two, like a one, almost a two hour class, right? So yeah, it's a two hour class. And um, so they're given the full two hours we're very flexible. They can finish it later. They can come back the next time. But we have a lab for every class. So it's not like we give them more class time, really. They have to come back on a day off when they have a day off, or you know, they have to arrange with our lab director. And, you know, so it's not, but two hours should be enough time. But a lot of them, this one, they did struggle through. But, and then the test will be, we'll give it a, a test after this in a few weeks that is similar, but not quite the same. So if you didn't learn it and understand it, then you're gonna have a problem doing the test. Um, so, okay. And then the technology is, you. so the E is for um, employability. 
So you basically it said to use, um, this came right out of a, a oops, sorry. Uh, I went back too far. Let's go back to play from current slide and go back by one. Yeah, so employability, it's really from a specific, you know, education thing. And that's also got a link in there in the template. So you will be seeing these templates and they tell you exactly the details. I could I could put it up in a minute if I have time left. But the student demonstrates the ability to adapt to new technology and choosing appropriate tools to accomplish tasks. They must be able to set up the domain name server with little guidance and looking online for detailed instructions. So more or less what I had found in my experience is no one comes and says, set up a domain name server. This is how you do it. Da, 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 da. They just say, you know, this needs to be done, figure it out. And you have to figure it out, go online and find the right directions. So that's pretty much, I'll show you the exact directions the students were given for this particular example. So it's critical in the ever-changing world of technology where directions change as quickly as the technology. So being able to do it, you know, um, this. Um, you know, being able to do it without being guided. So this is our full directions for this. It's basically install DNS. You'll need to create DNS zone, use something like this and use the zone for your host only network. One set of directions, there are plenty of others. It's up to you which ones you use and you have to change the IP addresses and show us that you can verify it. Okay, so that's pretty much it. I found this to be a really interesting session from the other schools. <laughs> so so I'm you. glad I came. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so okay. Gretchen Bliss, who is wearing many hats uh, as usual and, and coming in uh, from WISIS. Welcome, Gretchen. You want to take it over? And uh, Yair, can you pull up uh, May? Oh, you did already. Great. He's ahead of the game, right, Anne? He always thank is. you all. <laughs> well, and thank you all. And thank you, Ann, for hosting on Sandra and I's behalf. We're both at conferences, um, digging in and having some fun here. So um, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who presented today. You guys were, did an amazing job. I think the breakout sessions are going to be wonderful discussion as always. And I wanted to also let everybody know that next month we do have an opening. Unfortunately, one of our presenters had to had a scheduling issue and wasn't able to join us. And I've actually exhausted my backup list at this point. So if you want to be backup, um, let me know. And I would love to put you in for our final one of the spring. Um, yeah, as everyone knows, we're going to take the summer off and then start back in the fall. So I have, I have notified at least those first few sessions in the fall of, of where we're headed. But if you would like to move into the spring and not have to worry about it over the summer, um, I'd be happy to move you up too if you wanted to do that. But Thank you guys so much. We are getting there. Um, and we also are gonna be reaching out. We are scheduled completely through December. And so in the fall, we're gonna reach out to all those CAs that we haven't yet heard from and see if we can get them on the agenda for next spring. So if you know anybody, tell them it's not as scary as you know we make it look sometimes, um, but invite your friends if you haven't seen them on this in the CA community. We're gonna pump it a lot next week too at the CA meeting in Louisville. Um, but you know, get in touch with me at gbliss at uccs.edu. And just thank you all so much. Back over to you, Yair and Ann. Excellent, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Just reminder for everyone. Uh, we are recording all of these events and they are shared on the uh, CAE community YouTube channel. And also the links to those events uh, are all documented on our page. So stay uh, for a minute. I'm going to uh, stop the recording and then we'll kick off the uh, breakout uh, sessions. I'm asking the presenters to please move to the rooms that are under your names. Hold on.